Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus, uh, the, providing a local context to the global pandemic. This webinar is brought to you by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Prevention, Michigan Prevention Research Center. I'm your moderator today, Yvonne Lewis, co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center's Community Corps, and we're happy to have you join us today for this webinar. We have over the last 132 weeks had an array of partners who've joined us every week uh, as they are able to, to support in sharing information with you about programs and resources available in the community. And we certainly want to appreciate all of our partners who have come to join us today. Our, some of our partners are here today to answer questions for you. If you have questions that you'd like to put in the Q&A, and the, we'd love to have you put those questions in so we could be able to answer them for you. Today, um, as always, we have a great lineup of conversation for you today. We're going to be talking about the topic, is the pandemic really over? I know we've heard a lot of conversation about that in the last few days. And then there's a special presentation on using art as a, document, as a way to document COVID's impact on our lives. And we've had a lot of conversation about how COVID has impacted us. And of course, always, we want to make sure it, from time to time, we've had something that would support us in looking at resiliency and how we can cope during uh, these challenging times. So we have a presentation on resiliency and mindfulness, and we'll give you some updates on uh, from the health department today as well. And so we'd like you to join us today. Uh, we're going to get started because for the last few weeks, you've heard us talk about the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center's uh, symposium. And this is 2022. And we're going to invite Dr. Susan Wolfer to talk about the symposium. And we'll make a link between the symposium and the webinar in, a, in shortly. Dr. Wolfer. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It is my pleasure, as usual, to talk about our symposium, which is coming up next week, next Friday. My goodness, time just flies by. We hope that you will all join us for the symposium that starts, registration starts at 9 a.m. on Friday. And um, then the webinar will also occur. So you won't have to miss the webinar by being there at the symposium. We're actually going to be broadcasting live from the Riverfront um, Center in Flint. And so if you come, we'll have registration, we'll have a poster session, there'll be a keynote presentation, we'll have presentations from all of the posters, and then we have oral presentations, and then we will do the live streaming of the webinar, which will include information about the CERB, and we'll have a panel discussion. And in the afternoon, we're going to have breakout sessions so that one can network and connect with others who are invested in making a difference in health in Flint. And then we will cap things off with an award ceremony because we really want to recognize people who have done stellar work within Flint. And then um, the, our own Dr. EJ will be giving us our call to action at the end. So you don't want to miss it. We have extended registration um, until Sunday um, at midnight. So it was supposed to end this Wednesday, which is what I had said last week, but um, we could see that people were still getting in those registrations. And so we wanted to give you a chance. If you know of any friends, family members, people in the community, please let them know about it. The link is still open to register, but it will close Monday night, uh, Sunday night. Um, but yes, so you have a couple more days to get that registration done. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for letting us highlight that. We really hope that people are able to come and benefit. Oh, and I should also mention that it's not just for academics, right? It is for community members, those in public health, people in industry, anybody who's interested in impacting the health of residents in um, in Flint. So Dr. Wolf, one of the things that we're looking for in the, symposium, in the symposium is to see where there might be some connectors with some of our academic partners, some of our community partners, and really to understand what some of the community needs might be. So those breakout sessions are gonna be really exciting. 
Absolutely. If we don't have community voice, then it would be very hard to say that the day is a success. It will only be successful as we have everybody at the table. And so we really very much would like or as many community members as possible. And I should have said, it's completely free. Um, there will be lunch and snacks and all kinds of things to keep you um, energized throughout the day. But it's important that we have as many people come as possible. Now, I realize that many people are working and maybe can't take off the whole day, but if you could come just for the lunch hour, that would be great. Maybe you wanna take your lunch hour, um, a little bit later so that you could come for the breakout session so you can really get to share your opinion. Um, but if there's anything that you can do to be there, we'd be most grateful. Thank you, Dr. Wolford. Now you mentioned that um, the webinar would go on during the symposium. So I wanna invite you to talk to us a little bit because we've got another little announcement that we wanna make and, and just share uh, because we have had so many partners that have joined us over the week, community members from around the, the, the community and even some that are not in our community have joined us for the webinar. And so we've got a little bit of, a, of webinar news that we'd like to share with you. Um, when we have thought about the changing times and some of the changes in the, the information that we've been sharing, it was been brought to our attention that maybe we could expand and, and offer some additional offerings through the webinar. And so I'm gonna invite uh, Dr. Wolford to say here and Dr. Uh, Uphold to talk about what's going to happen during the month of October. And it's it's been a real challenge for us to get to this point where we have to say, um, you know, we need to, to take a little bit of a pause in order to think through and engage you in a more, uh, in, in even more in the next couple of weeks as we move forward. Sure, thank you so much, Yvonne, for asking or for raising this, this point. So I'm just gonna take us back a little bit on memory lane um to 2020, 2020. March 2020 everybody remembers march 2020 but at that time we were planning for again for our symposium and in those days um pre-pandemic our symposium was in spring and so we were planning for it and it was supposed to be march 20 march 20th 2020 and then because the, of the pandemic, we had to just suddenly stop that. Obviously, we couldn't have anything in person and we had to decide what do we do? And I remember saying um, repeatedly to Yvonne, Yvonne, we have to be able to do something. We must be able to do something. We can do it. Even in a couple of weeks, we can do it. Um, and Yvonne and Deborah and the whole team made it happen within a very short period of time um, with 7 a.m. meetings and all sorts of then 7 p.m. meetings um, made it happen so that we could start this webinar. When we started, we had the idea that maybe we'd do a week or two so that we could just sort of catch people up on, you know, what viruses and what coronaviruses and things that we can do to be safe. I don't think any of us predicted that 133, 32 weeks later, we would still be here doing a weekly program. Now, many people online are, have a history in media and television and realize what that kind of work, that what kind of work it takes to do something like this. That's a lot of work. Um, not having been in that space before, I don't think I realized just how much work it would take, but it took hours of many people's efforts and lots of partnerships to bring this um, valuable resource to the community every week. What so we have is that there's a need for this, but we want to pivot. We're not saying that there's no more coronavirus, but we want to pivot so that we can make it a broader topic and really just grow, go from strength to strength. And to do that, we're going to take the month of October to revamp. So send us your ideas, call us, email us, stop us in the street, let us know <laughs> what you want so that when we relaunch in November, it's, um, as I say, just getting stronger and stronger. So Dr. Wolfer and Dr. Uphold, one of the important things is, and I think I wanna really give, um, 
give credit to this because Dr. Deborah for Holden was really, really critical in helping to figure out all the background and MSU had really come forward tagging onto that team along with what you said, Dr. Wolf, we had no idea uh, that we would be this long and the, con and the continuation of information that needs to be shared by all of the partners. How, do, how would we in this community, in this county, be able to move forward with this. And so one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did is responded to some of the community requests to address some of the other issues as well. So I just wanna give a pause to, and thank you all and thank everyone for all the work that's been done and to ask you to continue to, to hang around and be with us and, and help us as we plan through these next few weeks. So. I want to give Dr. Hever Dr. Heverland a chance to speak, but before yes. she does, I just want to acknowledge when I said it takes so much work, a lot of that work I was talking about is done by Dr. Heverland and her team um, and Yvonne and her team. And as was mentioned, Deborah and her team. So when Deborah moved, you know, to um, her, the position in New York and we were so excited for her, it was a big concern because she was the heart and soul of this, making this move and um, being able, and Dr. Hevelin just kept it going and took it forward um, with Yvonne and all our partners. And so I just wanna just give a shout out for all of that work. But I think that this is a perfect opportunity for us to build on that success and expand it. We want to expand our reach. We're so grateful for the folks who show up every single week, whether you're an attendee or a panelist uh, here to answer questions. So this is really us getting ready to just explode into tackling other areas and inviting other speakers. And one of them, I'm gonna help us transition into our next section. Our next session uh, is someone that we got the opportunity to talk to last week, which is Dr. Harris. So we are excited to have her back. Um, and so we're going to hear a little bit, Dr. Harris, share with us about your background, um, what your plans are, and even an award that you won last night. Yes, yes. Thank you, Helen. Um, I appreciate being able to come back as a panelist, but also talk about um, my next new chapter. Um, so I am a family medicine doctor here in Flint. Um, I grew up in Flint and came back after residency. Um, in 2020, um, I did residency in Chicago at the University of Illinois and did uh, medical school at Georgetown in DC. So after all of that, I knew that I wanted to come back home. And so I luckily got a job back in Flint in 2020. Um, since then, I've kind of grown a desire to do something a little bit different in Flint. And I've actually started the process to open up my own clinic. Uh, it'll be just north of downtown in the North Bank Center of U of M Flint. Um, it's going to be a direct primary care clinic, which means that I take people who have insurance, who don't have insurance, and it's a membership-based primary care service. And so it's really going to fill the gap of those who don't have insurance, which is 7% of the population in Genesee County, but also those with high deductibles, which is a, a majority of people, especially if you don't have Medicaid. A lot of people have high deductibles that they aren't able to afford in order to get their insurance to cover the rest of their expenses. So if you have uh, the average deductible on the Michigan marketplace is over $4,000. The average premium is over $300. Um, and so I'm offering uh, monthly memberships from 30 bucks for children to 60 to 80 bucks for adults, depending on your age. And if you don't have insurance, this is like a prime optimal time to get primary care services, which is majority of what people do. Most people don't need the emergency room. Most people don't need the hospital on a yearly basis. And so focusing on your primary care and your health is what I'm trying to do and offer people a way to um, have more power in how they access their health care, um, have a place that is more transparent, have a place where you don't have surprise medical bills. Um, you also have um, more access, more time with your doctor to address more concerns so you're not delaying your care. I know in uh, Jancy County, uh, majority of people can't get timely appointments, they're months apart. It took me four or five months to get a primary care doctor when I moved back and that's that's hard when you like have something that you, you want to immediately address. And so I'm trying to fill that gap of those who are uninsured, who aren't going to the doctor, who are delaying their care because of pricing. I'm also trying to fill the gap of people who have high deductibles, who um, have a hard time managing their care because of the price of medications or, or just trying to get to the doctor. 
Um, I'm going to be having discounted prices for medications, like directly distributed from me as your doctor. Um, medications can be pennies on a pill compared to the you know, multiple dollars that the pharmacy may sell them as. Like you can get blood pressure medicine for 50 cents for the, for the month or 50 cents for a couple months. Um, and so I'm really trying to fill that uh, uh, gap as far as medication access because a lot of people don't fill their medication because of cost. But also labs, I'm going to get labs for three, four, five dollars a lab as far as checking your iron, checking your diabetes labs. And so it's really wholesaling uh, medical care um, and it's giving people an opportunity to uh, have more time with their doctor, uh, build a relationship that's stronger than the quick rushed appointments that you may have in a doctor's appointment and just feel like they can take control of their health care. I feel like they're going to be burdened by medical debt, which is a leading cause of bankruptcy in the United States. Um, and just feel like they can be a healthier version of themselves, have improved quality of life and just go on and, and hopefully do great things in Flint and Genesee County. And I'm just super excited about this. It's, it's going to open in January. Um, you can go to my website, harrisfamilyhealth.com and sign up for the wait list. If you have questions or concerns, you can definitely contact me and I'm going to have meet and greet starting in October. Um, so it's just a really exciting time to offer alternatives to people in Genesee County um, and just really give them a chance to know how simple things can be and how powerful it is to feel good about yourself and be a healthier uh, version of yourself. Um, and I guess as far as yesterday, I was in the 100K Ideas pitch competition. And so I talked about um, my idea and problems it would, it would kind of uh, bring. Um, I got the People's Choice Award, so I won $1,000 for um, my business, which will help with a lot of equipment and and just building up um, my supplies and, and all the regulation things it takes to start your own medical practice. Um, but it was really exciting to be voted for People's Choice because Harris Family Health is going to be for the community. And there's a lot of people that people don't understand that don't have insurance or can't use their insurance because it's too expensive. And so I'm really trying to offer something to um, the community and it's just going to be great. I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, and congratulations on that. I do want to uh, just take a step back, too, uh, and say we did have November 2nd on that, um, but it will be November 4th. We will be on Friday in November. Uh, so thank you for that observation. That's one of the great things about what's happened on the webinar. If we get a wrong date, somebody really uh, helps us out. So uh, again, uh, thank you all for your um, participation. Now, one of the things, Dr. Harris, that you, you mentioned is the need for uh, primary health care. And as we move forward, we understand that there's conversation now about whether or not we're still in a pandemic. Is the pandemic over? And so I want to invite you and Dr. Wolfer um, and um, Haley Blaney to come and, and talk about this a little bit more for us, uh, because as we started off with the webinar, we started off talking about the coronavirus as a pandemic. And uh, as Dr. Dr. Wolford mentioned, you know, in, in preparing for this, it was a lot that we needed to learn and, and still learning. So we want to talk about what it, is a pandemic really over? And there's some there's some information about the endemic pandemic that we'd like you to, to share. Uh, and so we'll start with, with Kaylee Blaney. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. So excited to talk to everybody today. Um, one of the things just to preface this conversation about is the pandemic over, it's important to know the terms that people use for illness. I'm sure once we go over these, you'll realize that a lot of times um, these are not necessarily used correctly. Um, so when we're talking about an endemic um, epidemic or an outbreak, we're talking about a disease occurrence that's happening specifically in a concentrated area. It could be a city, it could be a town, it could be a state, an entire country, but we're usually talking about a pretty sudden increase in a very specific location. When we're talking about a pandemic, we're talking about an epidemic that has spread across different regions of the world. Um, different people have different definitions of what that is. Typically, if you have an epidemic of the same illness at the same time on four continents, usually that is defined as a pandemic. Obviously, right now um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we do have 
cases on six of the continents that are inhabited by um, actual human beings. Um, Antarctica, obviously the seventh continent is not inhabited by um, a large amount of individuals. So really we focus on the six continents that are ha inhabited by a lot of people. When we're talking about endemic, which is what we're talking about a potential transition to from the COVID-19 pandemic to the endemicity of COVID-19, endemic means that you have a disease or an illness that is present at all times. So to use an example that we're pretty familiar with um, is something like influenza. We see sporadic influenza cases throughout the year. Um, it's not uncommon to see influenza at a low level year round due to travel. However, when we get into the November, December, January, February, we're usually looking at a flu epidemic and we see that pretty consistently every year. So I just wanted to go through those quick definitions before we start our panel discussion on what we're looking at in terms of COVID-19 moving forward. I guess I can add to that. So like she was saying, it definitely depends on the definition, but one of my cautions with what um, was recently said about it being over is that people will stop thinking that they should be kind of concerned or be protecting themselves and that it can't kind of rise again. When you think something's over, you kind of like brush it off and say, it's, you know, it's never gonna happen again. And, and because you're able to um, respect the pandemic and respect the need for precautions, um, I want people to feel like they um, should still be well aware and that all because one person says it's over doesn't mean that there's not something going on in your community, in your state uh, that you should be kind of aware of. And just like other infections, you know, they all rise and fall um, with kind of the season, with the outbreaks, whatever it may be. Um, and so just being well aware that uh, COVID is still around, is still impacting people um, in their everyday life, as well as uh, people in the hospital settings and our first responders. So um, over is a very, very strong word, um, but I think until there's a lot less infections and in in, in continue to have decrease in deaths, we can't really um, brush it under the rug like it's something that we shouldn't be thinking about anymore. Dr. Wilford. Oh, go ahead, Kaylee. I was just going to say, I think she makes a great point about we have to still consider what the risks of COVID-19 are. Even if the pandemic is declared over, if we are looking at COVID-19 on an endemic level where we're seeing a low level of cases all the time, that doesn't mean that we don't have pockets of our community that are going to be vulnerable to COVID-19, whether it's an end, whether it's endemic, whether it's a pandemic, or whether um, you know, it's endemic now. So I think we have to consider that even if there is a point where the pandemic is declared over, just like with flu every winter, we know that there are people that are more at risk for hospitalization. And we know that there are folks that are more at risk for death. So I just do want to caution people that even if we do get to a point where we've got folks declaring that the pandemic is over, just because the pandemic is quote unquote over, that doesn't mean that there's no risk due to COVID-19. So it's still important to protect those family members that are immune compromised. You know, if you have a family member who had a solid organ transplant who might be at adverse risk if they were to contract COVID-19, it doesn't mean that there's no risk of COVID-19 anymore. It just means that our hospital system is not as strained as it was, that we're not locking things down, that we're not all staying in our homes. Just because the risk level is lower doesn't mean that there isn't going to still be risk to some members of our community. Dr. Wolf, from your perspective, what about peace? So this is a very interesting um, situation because um, as has just been said by everyone, pandemic being over does not mean COVID is over. Those mm -hmm. are, you know, those things are what people are thinking, but it's not. It's just terminology. Okay. It's just naming. It's, um, you know, if I have a pot on the fire and it's boiling and I turn it down, now it's simmering. It's still hot. I still can get burnt, but, you know, the difference between boiling and, and, and simmering. Um, and that's what we're seeing here with this naming, how we're called, what the what we terms we want to use to describe the stage we're in. But we're in a stage where there are still 
around 300, sometimes more people dying every day from COVID. There are still people in the hospital because of COVID. I looked at the numbers yesterday. We actually have pediatric patients in the hospital because of COVID. So um, just like um, in, in, uh, Dr. Reynolds would love to say, if he were here, that we need to think about the level, the layers of protection and which ones we need to use based on our risk, right? And part of the fact that we are going going, I'm not, I don't know when we cross that threshold, but when we're going from calling it a pandemic to calling it endemic, part of the reason that we're able to get to that transition is because of the vaccines, because people have more immunity now, because we have medications, because we have better ideas of how to treat people. So all of those things allow us to get from where it's causing this huge upheaval for our society to where we're able to exist because we know how to put those layers of protection into place. And one of those things is getting people vaccinated and that goes for our kids particularly who are in school with lots of other children. Often people are not wearing masks. So um, it's important because as we know, they can get it, they may not get it very sick, but then they can pass it on to others who would get sicker. Thank you, Dr. Wolford. I just wanna offer, we have a couple minutes in this section left. I just wanted to offer if Dr. Young had a comment that he'd like to make in, in reference to, is the pandemic over? Good afternoon. Um, I know to follow up my comments I had from the last um, session, I know I was obviously I'm speaking from a women's health or reproductive health perspective, and I, I touched on um, COVID related to pregnancy, but I know there was a kind of follow up questions regarding um, the ability to get pregnant in uh, infertility or infertility. And, and women looking to start a family as it relates to making decisions about getting the vaccine or how getting the infection will impact it. So uh, as I mentioned, similarly with pregnancy, there was a lot of misinformation um, that came out early in the pandemic in 2020. Um, and obviously when the vaccine rollout occurred was um, there was a lot of misinformation around that the vaccine will cause uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, infertility, or essentially sterilize uh, patients and, and, uh, and women who are looking to get pregnant. And that information was originally uh, came about from Europe when there was some theoretical risks surrounding. So basically how vaccines work, as we know, to get back to the basics is obviously your body makes uh, antibodies or immune response to the viral infection and that's similarly how vaccines work you develop antibodies um, there's um, so basically the uh, uh, expression of proteins in a developing um, pregnancy are similar to the proteins that are expressed by the virus so there was this theoretical risk that those antibodies that you develop after getting the vaccine will not only attack the covid uh, virus but also attack the placenta developing pregnancy but uh, if that was the case, then a natural infection would cause a woman to have um, infertility and pregnancy loss. But there's been thought, what, to kind of wrap it up, follow-up studies have shown that there's no difference in pregnancy outcomes and ability to get pregnant in women who have, uh, have been infected or had the uh, vaccine. Um, and our American Society of Reproductive Medicine, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, all support uh, vaccine and dispel that misinformation surrounding infertility and the COVID vaccine. So um, to provide that reassurance for young couples who are looking to start a family and balancing that with the decision to get the vaccine um, as a healthcare provider, we all support um, women. And again, it's an individual decision. I mean, you have to, like you said, weigh your individual risk factors when deciding to get the vaccine, but to give that added reassurance is that there's no data to support that it will um, increase your risk of pregnancy loss or infertility. Thank you, Dr. Young. Thank you, Dr. Wolford. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And thank you, Kaylee, for that in information that you shared with us during the roundtable. Gives us more things to think about. And we'll look forward to hearing even more as we move forward. And so today, we also want to want to shift over here to uh, Dr. Uphold, who is going to introduce our next panelist. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do this one. 
Um, we are inviting, we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Natalie Phillips join us today. She is a um, she is an associate professor, but she's also the director of the Digital Humanities and uh, Literary Cognition Lab. I got a little tongue tied there. Sorry about that. Um, but we're excited because she's here to talk to us about art and COVID and some coping uh, mechanisms that, that folks use and some results. And, and I'm so excited because I hope you, you share some of the um, images that you should oh you are oh good 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 um because i think folks will just love it so i'm going to turn things over to you natalie and your team and take it away thank you all right thank you so much for having me um i'm just gonna wait a second and let jacob get set up and and do a screen share of our powerpoint um let's see but i'm delighted delighted to be here thank you so so much for having me and us um, at the Flint Community Webinar for Coronavirus. It's a delight to be here. You guys are doing fantastic work and I'm really excited to be engaging with, with you. Um, so I'm Dr. Natalie Phillips, as Hazelyn said, I'm a prof in English and affiliated faculty in cognitive science. Um, I do interdisciplinary research at the intersection of humanities and sciences. Um, so brain scans, behavioral studies, um, and now online outreach. Uh, to investigate the sort of intricate cognitive dynamics of how we engage with art. Um, I'm also a professor with disabilities, um, as I'll be demonstrating right now, um, specifically a neurological disorder that causes episodic muscle spasms, as well as, as you can hear, um, hiccup-like patterns in speech. Sometimes the spasms will take me to the ground and I'll probably keep talking. Um, but just enjoy the shakeup of traditional academic performance and all sorts of other things that that brings. And I have two lead researchers here with me, Suyan Cho and Jacob, Jacob Okulowitz, who can and should take over for me at any point if everything, if spasms get too tough. Um, and that's because everything we do in this project is thanks to them and the amazing group of researchers that they stand for. Anyway, all right. Onwards. Um, so today I'll be talking about some early results and long-term goals of our Mellon-funded grant project, um, Creativity in the Time of COVID. And uh, in particular, it's investigating how people from all walks of life and communities have turned to creative outlets during the pandemic and the, the crucial role that these everyday acts have played in supporting well-being, crisis processing, and mental health. I'm excited to say we have over 2,000 submissions um, from local, national, and global communities. Um, this is also a call out to Flint. Um, we have, um, you know, submissions from Colombia and Fiji and all of this, and I, I think it's so important to hear uh, the voices and the experiences of the Flint community. Um, but we have the submissions. We also then have stories in particular of how creative outlets have been helping people during the pandemic, and this comes from our survey. And then also because there's an upload of, of samples and examples of what people are doing, we have diverse samples of pandemic art and creativity, and that's uploaded text and images and videos and all sorts of things. So one of the goals, one of the core goals of the project is also, and I'm, it's crucial to say this, is to call special attention and foreground hardcore um, communities and creative acts that often get overlooked. Um, folks hardest hit by the pandemic based on the radical inequalities uh, revealed and exacerbated by COVID-19 around race, class, sexuality, and disability. Um, so I'm going to, you know, move on. There's here's some things we're seeing so far, right? We're in the middle of this project. We're still gathering submissions. The submission window closes October 31st. Um, but, you know, as we're gathering all of this, we're looking through it and beginning to see some themes. And none of this is super shocking, but it is really powerful. Um, we're seeing people using um, the creative outlets, whatever they are, to process grief and loss, to try to find ways to express the sort of inexpressible um, moments that we've been going through, the uh, sort of collective um, difficulty and um, uh, of, of just making it through um, this pandemic, which as you know, as we were just talking about is still affecting um, communities uh, to manage pandemic or endemic now, uh, stress and anxiety, 
Um, and as we're looking through this, numerous people um, in the surveys are in particularly mentioning stress and anxiety as part of the reason for turning to these creative outlets so far to find spaces for connection. Um, and then I think most importantly, to sort of start articulating and push back against um, some of the patterns of systemic discrimination that have been revealed and um, and intensified during COVID. Um, and so one of the, the long-term goals of the project as well is to sort of showcase the power of art during crisis, um, especially when those creative outlets are being chosen by individuals and communities that are facing that crisis on the ground. So community-based, community-centered, um, not art practices that are being imposed uh, top-down. Um, and I'll come back to that at the end. But so in a moment, I'll be sharing some early results from our study. But as since our project's in progress, I just wanted to share two pieces that have come out from Frontiers in Psychology regarding the power of art and creativity regarding mental health. Um, so this first um, example, there's a 2020 article from Kapoor and Kaufman. They scoured online memes. Uh, Twitter feeds and viral videos to investigate how creativity helped people in early stages of the pandemic. They have a great lit review, if anyone's interested, of um, showing how everyday creative activity is linked with positive mood and well being, um, and argue that the creativity that they found going viral online might be helping folks, quote, shield against some of the negative effects of the outbreak. And like us, they focus on these really everyday acts of creativity that I think we often overlook from baking bread um, to homemade mask making to things that I don't know, we may have forgot about, but the viral trends like inv individuals dressing up in Halloween costumes to take out the trash called a bin isolation outing, using toothpicks uh, to press elevation elevator buttons or covering light switches with saran wrap in earlier periods to restrict touching surfaces in public spaces, residents in Italy who took to singing from their balconies at times to maintain solidarity and uh, example of UPS employees who started dressing up as superheroes um, to bring some cheer into their customers and, and presumably their own lives. That's the first one. Um, second study is a cross-cultural study of individuals in the US, Germany, and China from 2021. And they showed that functional creativity, which is defined as like creativity in the service of just solving everyday problems, um, like, you know, getting creative, figuring it out um, instead of arts related stuff um, improves well being during the pandemic crisis. So individuals from across these three countries reported that COVID led them to create engage in particular in creative activities. Um, you can think of the creation of this webinar as one of those kinds of activities, um, which in turn strengthened their self reported creative growth and led to a higher level of perceived well being. Um, Interestingly, reading COVID as a highly social problem, this cross-cultural study also notes that the positive coping effect of creativity is more pronounced for collectivist uh, societies like China um, than individual, individualistic ones, so US and Germany. All right, so moving moving to our stuff. Um, one of the things that really makes our collection unique in comparison with these two um, examples is that we're gathering not only examples of the creative work that people have done, but but stories about the fact it had on them during the pandemic and those are shared in the surveys. So as mentioned, people often talk about how their creativity relates to the anxiety and stress of the pandemic. And so one young woman here um, turned to art to find peace for herself amidst rising anxiety during COVID that she describes as, as tearing her mental health to pieces. Um, and the portrait that she created, and I think you guys can appreciate this here, it's, it's, I think it's really powerful, um, captures that sense of like searching for wholeness amidst fragmentation. Um, her hair is cascading down in these cropped bits of text. I don't know if you can see that, but there's like little little bits of text that you can't quite read. And the beauty of her face at the center, illuminated in browns and greens and reds, is surrounded by this collage of micro-cut photos those uh, photo clippings of her her live body and of her photographed body looking out at us from these all these various angles and postures. And she describes it as sort of battling fears of success while drowning in work. I think something we all can relate to. The piece carves out a space to sort of express the pain 
of fighting against the challenges, um, fighting every day against challenges of physical and mental health, while also imagining new ways, as she puts it, to live. The next example, which I think is really, really, really powerful, and I hope you guys find it powerful as well. Um, this is a case where after one chaplain's husband died of, of leukemia, the height of the pandemic, they found that she found that creating tribute posters to honor those in her pandemic hospice ward. So the people that couldn't contact their own families as they were dying um, became a way for her to, to work through her grief, as well as the collective grief of the friends and families around each patient. And you can you can sort of feel the presence of them. Sybil, Ernesto, Leo, Charlotte, Sato, Morgan, Carlos, Sam, Tim, Julian, Juan. I mean, like each each poster um and as she put it she just quotes um i wanted my patients to be humanized and not just a number with my social workers we'd contact the family of the dying patient and gather information such as their favorite color their achievements an image or symbol they loved and descriptive qualities revealing something about who they were and i think just to return to these i it's just this amazing, I think, beautiful moment of, of how each poster really does seem to capture something powerful about their life and personality. And so it's this example of how her way of grieving her husband became a, create, a collective creative act, memorializing the people who couldn't be with their loved ones in these last moments, and then offering tribute, I think deep tribute uh, to their lives. So next slide, Kai would love to come back to this in Q&A if you want. Um, but great example of CSW in action. Um, in cases we needed a starker example of the power of art, I went for that today because I figured, you know, like, let's find the ones that really, really say it. Um, in this piece uh, from a woman in Colombia, uh, painting open a space to fill a powerful void, as she put it, the desperate desire to express the inexpressible desperation and the desire to express, and it helped um, her avoid suicide uh explicitly said it helped me not to kill myself um and this isn't a world where some magic flip just switched um i think in this she really describes that she found a way to in in finding ways to uh, to paint and to display the the fracturing the pain the as she put it um you know this this skeletal uh, figure, um, it's called, it's called utero, um, that, you know, that it's, it just found a way to quote, deal just a little better with my inner world, right, which I was afraid of, and at least now can access. So this piece of just like accessing a tiny bit of this pain of this space of this, um, the different faces and poses that that made up her life. Um, so okay, so we've, we've shown you a lot of powerful, beautiful images because they're powerful and beautiful, um, but not all of the creative acts that we're gathering involve visual art. In fact, many of them don't. And um, sometimes it was just about the saying the names of emotions, connecting, knowing you weren't alone, knowing you aren't alone. Um, and so in this as uh, one med school professor who realized his students were struggling to keep going in spring and summer of 2020. Um, as he put it, when COVID had like ground all non-essential outpatient clinics and medical education to a halt, you know, um, he used Padlet to create a 30 day micro journaling project where med students and faculty could respond to a daily prompt. So this one was, how are you feeling about everything that's going on? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and as you can see, emotions just sort of poured out. Um, as students and faculty shared their anxiety, frustration, their overwhelm, their discouragement, their numbness, annoyance, um, discouraged the heaviness feel, uh, but also their increased motivation. Um, and as he put it, his quote was like that this for him, it, it became a way to give the students and faculty a way to know that they weren't alone and provide an outlet to express what they were feeling and to create a space where they could support one another. So um, moving to the next slide, um, in terms of, uh, this has all been very, very intense and just in terms of what we're collecting and what we're asking you and your communities to share, I, wanting to just emphasize that everyday creativity is of the essence. 
Um, and we have a quote here from Helena Bonham Carter um, about how anything counts as art. And I wanted to just, if we have time, J Jacob, do you think we have a moment to, to do the, the Twitter video? I don't think we do, but I hope okay. that so let's go it in the it in the chat. I'm so Put it in the chat. We'll keep going. Um, <laughs> and then want to get to basically it's, it's just to say that um, some of the the viral videos, um, but just to say that anything counts: finger painting, rock painting, um, nature videos, etc. And then finally, the the reason it's important to get everything and these everyday bits is because the goals of the project um it's to build an archive of everyday creative practices that diverse communities jacob this would be like slide 12 um the diverse communities um are using to survive and cope during COVID 19 um to explore and focus on the creative pandemic experiences of black indigenous hispanic latino arab american asian pacific islander lgbtqa and disability communities and then hopefully and most importantly using these to begin to reshape our very eurocentric uh white focused art therapy practices bottom up by focusing on creative outlets used by diverse communities on the ground in everyday life during the pandemic so with that, just want to say thank you for your time and attention to reflect for a moment on one thing that may have helped you get through the pandemic or is helping you get through the pandemic and to urge you to contribute and reach out to communities in Flint to contribute and uh, represent. All right. Thank awesome. you so much. Put your questions in the Q&A for Natalie and her team and make sure that um, we get that link in the chat so that folks can submit their art or written or, you know, any kind of information. Um, and also, Natalie, if you can put in your, your contact information so folks can reach out. We are going to move to, you know, anytime we're talking about mental health and coping and that sort of thing, we have to reach out to the Genesee Health System. And Katie Baxter is the individual that is going to be sharing with us today. She's going to talk about resiliency and mindfulness. Thank you so much, Heatherlyn. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having Genesee Health System and behavioral health at the table. It's so important. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about resilience and mindfulness. All of us have been through such a difficult time with the pandemic these last couple of years. It's, all of us have experienced different kinds of difficulties and our own community is still uh, dealing with the impact from the Flint water crisis and other challenges of uh, racial injustice and racial disparities and things. So we have to find ways to take care of ourselves. It's so important. So resilience, I want you to think about resilience and uh, what that means to you. The next slide, please. Elaine Miller Karras from Trauma Resource Institute tells us that resiliency is an individual's and community's ability to identify and use individual and collective strengths in living fully in the present moment and to thrive while managing the activities of daily living. So it's really about um, that being in the present moment and being able to thrive. So we'll talk more about that. So I want you to look at uh, this slide. Um, and if you look at there should be kind of like a little thunderbolt coming down here that's a stressor so uh, all of us have things that happen that are a, a stressor to us from time to time sometimes they're big things and sometimes they're little things well if you look at this i want you to think of uh, a stressor coming into your life it might be again something big you're dealing with or it might be something in traffic somebody cut you off or something uh like that and here things seem to be going okay and whatever it is it just kind of triggers you well some of us can um we react in different ways and we might be in kind of if you look at the blue bars here it's kind of like we call an okay zone. So you're not real happy about it. You might be irritated. You might get a little frustrated or maybe you're a little sad about something, but you can kind of roll through that. And sometimes we get bounced out of our, our um, okay zone or resilient zone 
And you see the, the young gentleman up there, he's kind of blowing his top. So we become angry, uh, we may yell, we may scream, we may even become violent. So that's where we don't want to be, of course. The other uh, uh, response we could have that's not healthy for us is uh, this example of the, the little one down here on the left who, you know, is kind of withdrawn and quiet. So it's kind of representing depression or isolation and withdrawing from the world. Either way, either way, uh, those are not healthy ways to cope. And we want to find a way to develop more of a really resiliency and stay in this resilient zone, like in the blue bars, kind of ride with things. Okay, the next slide. Oh, yeah. See, there's a trigger event. <laughs> okay, the, the next slide. Thank you. So the resilient zone is a state of well-being in mind, body, and spirit. And it allows us to handle stressors of life. You can be annoyed or angry, but you don't have to lose your head. Or you could be sad or kind of down, but you don't have to be washed away with, with sorrow. So you see in this blue, this blue um, bar again, and there's another, uh, I think if you hit the slide again, um, it'll show kind of, yeah, the resilient zone. So that's where we want to be when things happen for us that we weren't expecting or are unpleasant or difficult to be able to ride things out. So how, how do we do that? That's the important thing. Next slide, please. So this shows how some of us have a pretty shallow resilient zone. So when things happen to us, we can get popped up way up too high or way down low. And that's a problem for us. So we want to find ways to make our resilient zone a little wider. So things happen. Everyone has things that are happen to us. Um, even good change could be stressful. Things that happen and we're able to kind of ride with that. Next slide, please. So the APA offers some ways about resilience. So I'm just gonna briefly go over these for the sake of time real quickly. One is making connections. Think about relationships, how important those are to us. It's very important. Avoid seeing things as insurmountable. Change happens and there's always things that are going to happen in our life. And it's very important for us to be able to look at things in an optimistic way. Um, and uh, look at things um, and look at opportunities for challenges we experience. Change is a part of living. It happens to all of us all the time. We can count on that. Um, it's an opportunity towards move towards our goals. Um, challenges can be opportunities. And it's an opportunity for us to take divisive, decisive action and, um, and do something for ourselves. So sometimes you just think about what's one thing I can do today towards my goal. It also is an opportunity for us to self-discover who we are, things about ourselves. And um, every one of us is, is unique and we all have uh, things about ourselves and to appreciate and recognize the uniqueness of each of us and nurture a positive view of ourselves. Oftentimes we talk about being kind to others, but how important it is to be also to be kind to ourselves. Keep things in perspective. Uh, sometimes little things get us all out of shape, and uh, but we have to remember the big things are the most important things. Maintain a hopeful outlook. Uh, there's research that people who are optimistic live longer and happier lives than people who are not. And take care of ourselves. Talk about our sleeping patterns. Make sure we uh, get enough sleep and eat reasonably healthy diets and get some exercise. All that good stuff puts us in a state of um, more resiliency when difficulties come our way. The next slide, please. So how can mindfulness help us with this? Mindfulness is being fully present in the moment, aware of where we are, what we're doing and sensing, and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on. We're not living in the past of regret and we're not constantly fretting about the future. So being present in the moment is, is a gift. Next slide, please. So how are resilience uh, and mindfulness related? Mindfulness, again, is about living in the present moment and being intentional. And resilience is defined as bouncing back from adverse life events or from difficult situations. 
So being um, mindful can help you be more resilient. Next slide, please. There's research that shows that mindfulness builds resilience. So there's a lot of research on mindfulness, a lot of benefits, and more people are talking about it. These researchers concluded that resiliency is mostly cultivated from within, how we perceive and react to stressors. They say mindful people can better cope with difficult thoughts and emotions without becoming overwhelmed or shutting down, pausing and observing the mind may help us resist getting stuck in our story and as a result, empower us to move forward. Next slide, please. So everyday ways to practice mindfulness. These are little things, but even when you're brushing your teeth, um, you know, rather than thinking about or stressing about that meeting you're gonna go to, be present in the moment, you know, the taste of the toothpaste and, and what's, uh, you know, brushing up your teeth. Going for a walk, feeling the steps that you're, when you're walking, looking at the sights around, taking in fresh air, even making and drinking your morning cup of coffee or tea, the smell of it um, can be a mindful moment. Eating a meal, how many of us gobble our meal down, and, you know, before we even know it, we're doing something else. I know I'm guilty of that. So to enjoy our food, take a, you know, take a minute, enjoy it in the taste and the texture of the food and the temperature. Taking a shower, the hot and warm water, and uh, just being present in that moment. And mindful breathing is also a very popular way to do that. So now I'm gonna do a brief exercise with you about mindful breathing. So I'm going to invite everyone to participate or not. Uh, this is up to you. So I'm gonna do a breathing exercise. So feel free to join me. So I will encourage you, everyone who wants to participate, you may turn your camera off if you would like. I, I encourage you to make sure you're in a comfortable position. Your shoulders and arms are relaxed. Sometimes we don't even realize how tight our shoulders are. So just, just be mindful of that, our shoulders and our arms. And rest, you put both of your feet on the floor and your hands in um, your, or your lap or on your armrest. So I will invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable. If not, feel free to keep them open. I now invite you to focus on your breathing. It is helpful to bring an attitude of curiosity to this practice, like you're noticing your breath for the very first time and you want to learn exactly what it does. I invite you to place one hand over your chest or abdomen and notice the movement each breath creates there. No need to change the cadence of your breathing. Just relax your body and breathe. Observe each inhale and exhale without changing your breathing pattern. Relaxed and comfortable as you inhale, notice how your chest gently rises. As you exhale, notice it deflate. If your mind wanders, don't worry, be kind to yourself and simply refocus on your breathing. You are relaxed and calm, you are safe. Focus on the sensation of your chest rising and falling with each breath. Notice the inhale and the exhale. Notice each breath as it travels down your nose and throat to your chest and diaphragm. And follow the journey of your breath as it travels out again. Every breath brings life-saving oxygen to your whole body. You are fully present in the moment. You are rested and rejuvenated. Now I invite you to open your eyes if they are closed. And, and thank you for that. I know we're running close on our time, but that was just a quick two minute um, a mindfulness breathing. We can all do that. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it, if, if you notice, I hope you enjoyed it. 
a lot of times it can give you a little um, a rejuvenation. So thank you for participating. And I also wanna um, remind you that Genesee Health System is always here for you. If you're having mental health challenges, there is our contact information 24 7 365. Please reach out to us if you're needing any kind of mental health support. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Katie. And that was a good way for us to end our webinar today with a wonderful exercise on breathing. Hope that you will utilize this during the week. And then we will look forward to seeing you social workers and community health workers for you to stay on and get your social work credits. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Please join us in our live webinar through the symposium. And we'll talk to you a little bit more about next steps for the webinar. Thank you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Call for more information or info at hfrcc.org. Email us. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.